Hello and welcome to a bi-week recap edition here on the HLS Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ritter. You can call me MD Tex. And as always, you can find our podcast over on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you find your podcast app. Please be kind and leave a review while you're there. You can join us in Discord. That is our live chat channel, herloyalsons.com slash Discord. And of course, you can always find us at our home at herloyalsons.com. And with that, uh, Shane, it, it was nice and relaxing bye week, but I, I, I think uh, allergies and and kid on my end, kid sicknesses. Uh, but I, I'm glad we had the week to recover because goodness, I'm gonna need it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, now yes, but I mean before, yeah, I, you have to appreciate it. I mean, this hot dog bye week kicked ass, kind of. It right? did. It was pretty. It was pretty fun to watch some of these meltdowns or near even the near meltdowns, which. Would have been better if they had been full on meltdowns, but it was just kind of fun to be like, "Yeah, we know we're probably going to climb a spot or two. <laughs> and and we did indeed. And most importantly, we climbed over a certain team that a lot of people have pointed their fingers at and said, "Hey, I, I think they're rated a little too I high. Think they suck." Yeah, and we we will talk about said team. A lot of you will probably know exactly where we're going to end up going, but there was a lot of. Of great football. Some of it may have happened while you were asleep on Saturday, because I knew that certainly yep. happened to me. It uh, sure did. Uh, thank, thank goodness uh, the cord cutting experiment for college football has been working well, because even with a, a bullshit weather delay, I got an entire game recorded on the DVR without me having to touch it. So I we will talk a little bit of Cal Washington. We'll talk about the big house nearly hosting a big upset. And uh, the backup quarterback bowl, and a lot of other little odds and ends that happened throughout the week. But uh, we might as well start off. It makes sense to start off at the top, really. And the game of the night was LSU and Texas, uh, number six, number nine matchup. This indeed was very, very nice. Um, it was a fun game to watch. Forty-five to thirty-eight is your final. LSU getting a huge road victory. And, and the biggest storyline here is that it really was not an LSU-like game that we would normally expect at all, Shane. Hey. Yeah, yeah. this uh, this New York, this new look uh, LSU offense, it's like, it's legit. I mean, they clearly have, I mean, they don't have the best quarterback in the world, man. It's Joe fucking Burrow. But they're able to, to weaponize with their strengths, especially through the running game. And, and basically spread it out, even with a just a relatively serviceable quarterback, by even by LSU standards, which is something they've now become known for, they're they're wrecking people. And, and it's real, especially because their defense is outstanding. Yeah, and, and again, we can caveat this all we want and say, look, it's a Big 12 defense. Sure, if you want to do that, that's fine. I think that's a little bit fair. But the bottom line is, is that even against a Big 12 defense, they put up 573 yards. And Joe Burrow, again, who I think serviceable is about what we would expect him to be. Um, 31 for 39 is a little bit more than serviceable, going for 471 yards, four TDs, one interception. Yeah, three receivers over 100 yards. First time in LSU history that's ever happened. Same. And and, and it's not like they always like 102, 103, no. Uh, Justin Jefferson, 163 yards. Jamar Chase, 147. And Terrace Marshall, 123 yards. I mean, just, it's insane. And and, and yeah, Bert here in the the chat, it's hard to call him DBU because, uh, uh, or or rather that was, I think Texas said they were the real DBU. They came out in those warm-up jerseys and they got torched pretty bad for it. Yep. It it did not, it did not end well for them. Uh, But Sam Ellinger, uh, he had himself a good game too. Uh, it's not like he he shot the bed by any means. In, in a losing effort, he puts up 31 of 47, 401 yards, and four touchdowns, including one towards the end of the game where, I mean, Texas, they, they, they kept it. They did not stop. They kept fighting all the way into nearly having a picture-perfect onside kick return. Uh, the, the outstretched uh, receiver that was grabbing it just could not hold it and stay in bounds. Just missed it. Yeah, I mean, the way it always it's it started off with LSU kind of making their presence so well known so early that the way it felt from the first quarter was that there was going to be some back and forth, but that eventually LSU was going to outwill and outlast Texas by the pacing of the game. 
And I mean, that's effectively what happened, even though, you know, Texas kind of still showed no quit at the end. I mean, they were up 50, uh, 40, 45 to 31, you know, with effectively the game in hand, you know, and then Texas had to go for desperation, which, they, like you said, they almost did. But that kind of – it felt like that was the inevitable result because that's how consistently, I mean, good LSU looked, which is weird to say. Yeah, and even, even at the very end, and I remember being on Twitter, like, what, what are they doing? Why are they still in full attack mode? They're still passing. It felt like – LSU was about to discover a new way to fuck up the end game, which happened under Les Miles all the time. It oh, was yeah. just clock mismanagement being overly conservative. And, you know, I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you're giving free timeouts. And it, it, I understand when you get in the four minute drill, you still want to do passes. You don't want to just completely run it, but you tend to look for some of the safer routes. No, 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 no. They didn't look for a safer route because on third and 17, they just bombed the damn thing a 61 yard TD strike to Justin Jefferson, and that was, again, on a 3rd and 17. And the play before, Burrow took a sack. That is yep. some major cojones <laughs> yep. to call that no, there. Uh, and, and you know, honestly, had that backfired and had that been incomplete, you give Texas a free timeout, loads of time. Your defense is very tired, and both defenses in that Texas heat were extremely gassed once it came time towards the end of the game. But, man, I mean, it... LSU was rolling the dice at the right time. It was paying off, and, and they looked damn good doing it. And, and that's really the bottom line in this game. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. Uh, you know, Texas isn't any kind of slouch. You know, they, they still remain, I guess, to me, uh, maybe not. Uh, I, I didn't see the ranking, but relative, at least a top 15 team. You know, they, they kept pace. They, they showed that they have the opportunity to at least challenge Oklahoma in the Big 12 and make things interesting. But, um, yeah, LSU's for real. Yeah, they are for real, and, and LSU was getting a lot of love in the poll. Uh, they they are now the third SEC yep. team, uh, and of course these rankings uh, that are up now that we're discussing is prior uh, to the new rankings coming out, but LSU now sits at four, uh, Texas at 12. So Texas still getting a, a bit of respect there. Um, I mean, like I said, they didn't lay an egg. You know, They didn't look right. like... You know, Tom Herman brought their boys to fight. He just didn't cover for the first time as an underdog uh, in a while. It's now his third loss uh, on the spread, that is, as an underdog. Uh, so not quite the the SEC killer uh, that he has been before. Texas Texas might be back, but I, I tell you what, uh, the way OU is looking right now, that's yeah, going to be a hell of a game when, once they come down matter. the state fair. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're going to move on here uh, to the other major game. And that was number one, still number one, Clemson, taking on uh, Texas A&M, who falls to 16 from 12. Uh, man, I felt like I was watching the Cotton Bowl all over again, to be quite yeah, honest. Right. I mean, 24 to 10, the only difference, because, I mean, basically A&M came out, they, they were taking it to Clemson, it looked evenly matched, they get a field goal, they take the lead, no scoring in the first quarter, uh, but then all of a sudden, um, <clears throat> Clemson just turns it on. And it's 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 all over at the end there. <laughs> it's, whoa, we're having fun today with the the audio that I can edit out though. I think I think we can yeah. we can manage that. But um, yeah, so the only difference was Texas A and M did get a junk t- touchdown at the very end, and by the very end I mean six seconds at the end, and I mean Jimbo, why the fuck did you do that? Because with spread was covered. <laughs> if you're gonna lose, lose with dignity when I bet against you, sir. <laughs> like, yeah, man. Um, yeah, that, 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 the spread pissed me off. That, that, that definitely six seconds left annoyed the shit out of me. It was a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath for me on, on Saturday. Not going to lie. It was, it was bad. And this, this, I think started the quick rapid descent into me hating life as far as, as the degenerate side went. Um, it, it just ended up feeling like, you know, not long into the second quarter. I felt like it was pretty evident that Texas A&M wasn't, oh, yeah. this wasn't it. You know what I mean? Like, you could just sense that at any moment, Trevor Lawrence was just going to make an outstanding play, which he basically immediately did. They're like halfway in the second quarter. Um, and that that was it. And you just recognized that you had nothing to answer for that. Uh, Kellen Mond did his best impression of his of, of his performance last year for a half. And then the second half was just as bad, whereas last year it was totally different, you know? So, I, I don't know. It just never felt like... It, this felt like... I'm waiting for the Texas game to kick off so I could just flip over. Yeah, I, I, I spent most of my time in a pool. I was poolside uh, 
Uh, my brother-in-law has a has a TV set up outside his pool, so this was this was on, and I made once once I made the comment, I'm like, this feels like the the Cotton Bowl again, and you know, I'm just yeah. floating around, keep peeking over. I'm like, yeah, this is this is going exactly like that Cotton Bowl game did, uh, save for you know an injury that completely turned it on its head. And in this case, it was just you know Clemson just straight up whipping them, and, and that's really what happened. And and Trevor Lawrence, 24 for 35, 268 yards, one TD, one interception. Now, Kellen Mond, if you take a look at the box score, it looks like he kept up with them. 24 for 42 for 236 yards and a TD and interception. Uh, the thing is, though, 57 of those yards came on that final junk TD drive. Yep. So we're talking about a 179-yard performance, zero passing touchdowns otherwise. So yep. it was, man, it was it was bad uh, for, for the Aggies. And, you know, as an Aggie fan, it was rough to watch, but I, I kind of resigned myself that that was the, the likelihood of, that was going to happen. That's why I picked Clemson uh, with Eddie because I, I was for sure that, you know, the, the talent was going to win out. The talent did win out. They should have covered the 17 points. It just happens that, you know, the Aggies got that little junk touchdown at the end. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it feels weird, but you can basically almost always know that Texas A&M isn't ready to show up for a national stage upset when their wide receivers aren't a big part of that, of the, of the narrative of the game. You know, like if they don't have a big, passing play or a you know a a receiver that's kind of like their ace in the hole they tend to not find much other than relying on hopeful hopefully stable quarterback play and their their consistently good running game and that's kind of what happened in this game is they became relatively one-dimensional yeah. their second the clemson secondary nullified the a&m receiving core and you know a&m's running game was consistently good enough because kellen mon has his legs to account for but that only lasts for so long yeah and, and then then you end up with 53 total rushing yards you know to be yep. get, and, and total and exactly. that was it and then on top of that you have 85 yards worth of penalties for texas a&m you turn the ball over twice you only convert six of 16 uh third downs now you you got two two out of two fourth but that's not the recipe you have for an upset Especially nope. when you're that far out match, you you cannot do that whatsoever. Uh, and, and as far as the remaining schedule for Clemson, I mean, man, they have it sets up nicely for them because it's basically ACC play, South Carolina at the end of the season, and you got Charlotte and Wofford sprinkled in. Oh boy! <laughs> I mean, th- Good th- luck. Th- this was this was the uh, the bullet in the chamber that needed to land if you wanted to see Clemson kind of get knocked on their ass a little bit. Now it's going to be unless Clemsoning reappears, and that's going to be it. Nah, yeah, not a thing. I don't think. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I think ESPN put up stats and info that, that, that they they have the highest likelihood of winning out at I think fifty two percent likely. The next closest was Alabama in like the thirties. 38 yeah. and then UCF at 20. And, and Alabama is going to have a little bit tougher trek to go through. I mean, it's uh, Clemson, it, the schedule could not set up better for them a, yeah. at all. Uh, so, you know, they, they got past uh, the, the early stretch. Uh, I know they have the big marquee game against Syracuse next, which we'll talk a little bit about them later, but the shine uh, completely went off of that one. So eh, it's going to be nasty. Well, we mentioned that one game. Might have went down while you slept because we did have upsets. We will talk about the first of these, and that is Washington getting knocked off by Cal twenty to nineteen. This game, and and I, I'm glad that <laughs> I actually got the DVR uh, version of this because I was very surprised to see that final score. Because uh, after uh, uh, Fresno and uh, uh, Minnesota wrapped up, I'm like ah. Hey, no reason to watch this crap. I, I'm gonna go to bed. I'm done. I'm tired. It's been a day in the pool. Coach my kids' games. I need to go to sleep. And then all of a sudden, here we go. And and I tell you what, Washington. It's almost like what you would compare an old LSU team, but kind of like a Renan LSU. Right. I, all the way down to your Rena SEC quarterback in Eason, uh, who had a, a awful game. I mean, 18 for 30, 162 yards, no touchdowns, and an interception. Uh, oh my God. Washington, you know, the rush, uh, 46 rushes to 30 passes. They're trying they, they were L- old school LSU in this game. But the problem is, is that Cal had a good enough defense to hang around, hang around, hang around. And finally they, they broke through at the end once everybody got worn down and it was, uh, there was a two and a half lightning hour lightning delay. So the game resumed at 10 30 Pacific time. Ends at one twenty-two Pacific time, 
So, I mean, down here in Texas, it would have been 332. It would have been a. It ended at 122? Pacific, yeah. It would have been 4 a.m. plus. 422 a.m.? Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, I that can easily throw you off, but both teams had to deal with it. And, and kind of the beauty of this one is, is that for, for extreme Pac 12, I mean, early morning, not even after dark at this time, it's like Pac 12 at fucking morning, sunrise. Yeah. <laughs> A 17-yard game-winning field goal seals this one. Of course. And and Peterson had some, at least for me, the clock management seemed weird because as Cal's driving, they get inside the 10. They're tackled. Peterson's got all three of his timeouts. He decide, he decides with like less than about like a couple minutes ago, it was like 130-ish or so left in the game. He decides to go ahead and keep all three in his pocket to use on first through third and goal. Uh-huh. Ends up the way the game goes on and moves on. He has a timeout to freeze the kicker, which I'm just sitting here. It's like, if you would use that first timeout, what? you have about a minute plus maybe to, to try to, to make a last stand. Freeze the kicker. Yeah. So he froze the kicker on a 17 yard field Dude. goal. It was, I mean, it wasn't awful clock management. Uh, it, it wasn't some of the worst I've seen, but it was something That's... that raised an eyebrow. I was like, what, what the I'm sorry, but given everything about that circumstance and situation, that seems like a poor allocation of that opportunity. I, I would put all the pressure possible on Cal that they know that they got to do something yeah. in there or have them, res, you know, resign to the fact and be ultra conservative. Because one of their plays was that this was also weird in game management. This was by Cal on second down. They have a kneel down to center the field goal, but they still had to run a third down play. Which damnedest thing I ever saw. And then the third down play down. to we me, it. Fuck it. yeah, to me, there it still go. looked like it was a touchdown, but man, if, if I'm Peterson, I call timeout, gather my guys like, look, there's only one way we're going to win this game. Let them run through, let yeah. them in the end zone. And we have about, you know, a minute 40 minute 30 to try and score. Uh, and, and the, there's so many crazy stats from this one. Cal won this game by running only 49 offensive plays. They barely gained 300 yards. They were three for 11 on third down. Two Washington turnovers kept them in it, and basically offensive ineptitude as well. They I just, mean, it, it okay. was ugly. I'm not a genius, but I feel like I know that the worst thing that you can do, or the worst way to play Cal, is to keep your offense on the field most of the game because <laughs> their defense is the whole thing. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, Keeping them in your presence and not being efficient on offense is the way to lose to Cal because they will get enough opportunities to find a way to get your ass. It's just what's going to happen. Yeah, and with with Oregon putting up over 70 points, uh, so much for thinking Nevada was going to make a statement. Yeah, fuck. I was like, okay, they might cover. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so now, I mean, it, it looks like it, it, it's a two-dog race. Oregon, Utah, maybe. Maybe we've got a little bit of interesting Utah, things going on. Utah. Southern Cal, we'll see. I think Utah right now is in the driver's seat, but uh, Southern Cal, you know, I, as much as we, as, as much as I joked, you know, about the whole situation with Cal and how fucked they are, the truth is, is I don't believe that. I mean, you can see that Keaton Slovis is relatively serviceable. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, we, we will get to that. All right. Well, let's let's get to probably when you know you got a big noon game, Fox you got a big noon game, right. which every one of us circled. And yep. Army damn near does the thing, nearly takes down number seven Michigan, who escapes in double overtime, 24 to 21 against Army. Now, here's the thing about this game. This is not, and I really want to highlight this and drive it home because I'm glad the voters noticed this. They dropped Michigan down to 10. They did not give them the benefit of the doubt like they gave Oklahoma when a similar situation happened because Army held on to the ball. Oklahoma yep. just did not get a chance at it. Army barely won the time of possession battle here. They only won yeah. by three minutes. Three thir- 31, 35 to 28, 25. That's not the, the typical Army has is sitting on the football because Michigan, their new, new revamped offense, did the same damn thing. They yep. sat on the football. They were not uh, being aggressive. And here's the thing that... I think really, if you want the gigantic red flags, if you had any hope, uh, I doubt many people listening to this podcast had any hope of Michigan winning anything in the Big Ten. LOL. Yeah, absolutely LOL. They give up four sacks to Army. Yeah. 
Tackles for loss were in the double digits. To yeah. Army, that yeah, offensive lo- that offensive line is garbage. It is exactly. so bad. They're and- big old meal ticket. The oh, the Michigan offensive line. Ah, Jay Patterson's gonna have so much time to do apparently nothing because he's terrible. Uh, their offensive line is garbage. It's Every, garbage. Everything about this game was garbage when it comes to Michigan. And and again, Army, again, this is a very un-Army-like game. They only had 200 rushing yards. <laughs> Usually yeah. if they're going to pull this upset, they've driven the ball down the field three or four different times and have racked up somewhere around 300 yards because they've just held onto the ball that long and had so many uh, you know crazy long drives. That just didn't happen here. Michigan's new revamped offense, 340 yards total. Patterson, 19 for 29, 207 yards, loses two fumbles. That's yep. something else you can't do to Michigan. And again, remember, he fumbled the very first play of the game against Mitsu. Yep. Zach Carbonet needed 33 carries to get 100 yards. 33. Yeah, they, can we talk about that for just a quick moment? Just, <laughs> I want to highlight that. So they have this, what is he, a fifth-year senior now, Shea Patterson? I don't fucking know at this point. But he I, he is the you know the the big ticket the transfer quarterback from Ole Miss, and yet they are more willing to put the ball in the hands of a freshman running back than they than they are to, to, into his. Do you understand? Like they 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 preferred to trust Charbonnet over Shea Patterson doing any fucking thing at three yards a carry. Yeah, man. <laughs> his longest rush in the game was 12 yards look now, that's not that's not <laughs> army's d line being incredible people like i can just tell you just know that shit it's uh, it's the offensive line michigan's offensive line is as pedestrian as it gets in the big ten that's, and that's, that's that's what they've shown so far and the thing is and we haven't even talked about how the game really unfolded because army Quite frankly, they kind of fucked it up at a couple of occasions. Oh, man. Their first major the one game, yeah, was the first drive of the second half. Is probably the one that I would put a, on the play-by-play, the big red circle around saying, here's where you could have killed them, and then, ne- then l- never look back after that. That's right. <laughs> they start the second half by three and outing Michigan. So, I mean, Michigan's already trailing right now. It, it's 14-7, to seven, and they yeah. three and out Michigan. So now is the time to do the take the air out of the ball, hold it the whole time, and they, they look like they're doing it. They go 60 yards downfield, but that drive ends, and they're right on the <laughs> – they look like the worst-case scenario was going to be a field goal. Yep. But what happens instead is they decide to pass on third and goal on the five-yard line. Michigan picks it off. Michigan then ties the game up with a touchdown. So, oof. They, I mean, they turned over the ball over three times themselves – threw it the ball falling away like yeah. there was just nothing there to throw it just it, don't it, it was bad and, and really they they almost it was crazy that i mean they did try to pass they did try to do a little bit more at the end of the game but you could tell they were playing for the field goal yep. for a kicker that had yet to kick a field goal and that was a theme all week long this is his first collegiate you know field goal attempt and you you calling on him to kick a fifty yarder on the road to have one of the biggest upsets in Army history? That's a lot to ask for. And the kid drilled a hell of a At kick. At the distance, he yeah, it may have like been one of those where it scrapes the top of the crossbar and goes he had in. It though. But he probably would have gotten it. Uh, so really, it, it Michigan. The the reason why they end up winning this game. Is is because in the final overtime, the second one, they only get a field goal. So I mean, I'm I'm on the edge of my seat. Like, Army's got oh it. All they God. have to do is get a touchdown, and yes. it it just it went south in a hurry. <laughs> it was it was oh they, you know, not not much of a game. Then an incomplete well, they pass. Lost four sack. yards in first yeah. down, and, and you knew it was nothing over. in second down, and then it was third and nine, and. All hell broke loose. <laughs> yeah, and, and and it was a fumble that ended the game uh, at the end of it. Uh, but the the craziest part was that field goal too. Zero yards gained by Michigan in the second overtime. Yep. Playoff team, my ass. <laughs> my big old, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and look, again, to the national media's credit, they all turned on his ass in a hurry like, nope, we're not doing it. We gave I you mean, the benefit so of the doubt. Far, they- <laughs> They dropped them down three spots. I'm just saying, like, I don't know what could happen against, I don't know, Indiana. I don't know what could happen against, hey, Iowa. Like, it, anybody 
could catch Michigan's whole ass showing because it's been out. It's out now. <laughs> Do you have a defensive line with a pulse? You might be in the backfield against Michigan. <laughs> you might be. Yeah, you might defeat Michigan. Yeah, I mean, again, look, kudos to Army. You gave us a very entertaining start to the hot dog bye week on the Saturday. I thought you were going to do the damn thing. I'm not mad that you didn't do the damn thing. You exposed Michigan monumentally. It's very clear where the weaknesses are, and this is just going to cause all kinds of havoc, all kinds of hair yep. pulling. I love it. I, I can't wait to watch them play Michigan State. I can't wait now. I'm I'm actually giddy for Notre Dame to come up to Ann Arbor. Dude, to get a I can't at wait it. for them to play Maryland at this point. It's going to be awesome. They're so fucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Won't that be a story there? Maryland <laughs> kicks goes up there and kicks their ass. That'd be pretty I'm impressive. Saying, everyone looks sound. Even Illinois is putting up points. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, well, we're, we got some more games to run through. Uh, actually, we're, we're about to talk Stanford SC, uh, yep. but we will do that. Uh, we will be right back. Once we come back, we will talk about that game. And, and folks, this is where I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of ad space. Should we actually have it? We will see. Uh, but for those of you on the stream, one, thank you for joining. Two, uh, you can remember, you can always support us via cheers, the bits, the subs, all that kind of stuff. You can also go to anchor.fm slash your little sons you'll find a little link where you can support the show as well if you would prefer to do it that way you can also leave us a message there as well anchor.fm slash your little son slash message if you remembered all that all right with that let's get right back to it shane yep so let's go ahead and talk about uh a, a, the backup qb bowl which eddie and i basically told you to put the mortgage down on the under I am sorry that you have lost your house because I lost uh, my yeah, ass as well I, on this. <laughs> I disagreed with that, so I did. <laughs> uh, well, you were smart. I yeah. was not. I also went chasing a second half over to try to undo said damage. And thanks to Jet Toner not being able to remember how to fucking kick, you are now dead to me, you PC low letter motherfucker. Yeah. Oh, God. I, I was like, toner. I was like, I know this 24 and a half's a trap. This is going to blow up in my face, but I'm still going to do it. But anyway, yes, to the actual game, instead of my degeneracy, 45 to 20 is your final. Uh, hope you enjoyed your time in the top 25 Stanford. Nice Bye. knowing you. Um, yeah, Slovis is going to be a damn problem. And, and I got a little bit of blowback somewhat on Twitter saying it was like, oh, well, you know, Stanford isn't that great. It's like, okay, look, I, I understand that. You need to judge this guy on what he's doing. He's yep. a freshman. He's got poise that is very unfreshman like. He looked a hell of a lot more confident than Ian Book did yep. this past Monday. He wasn't phased. He didn't make a whole lot of mistakes. He didn't make a whole lot of dangerous passes. His ball placement was superb throughout the yep. entire game. And and the thing again where hey, he's he didn't panic. He had no panic to him. Stanford jumped out to a 17 to 3 lead. He was behind the eight ball immediately. SC was about to get run out of their own building by Stanford's backup quarterback. And then they go on a 42 to three run after. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, you, you can kind of just take what he's done. I mean, I know this was his first start, but you know, even in camp, right. When he came in, he was supposed to be like the throw in, Hey, third stringer, make sure you're there body guy. But apparently he was so good and so impressive that Jack Sears was like, fuck this. I'm transferring. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like he was that good. And, and the coaches apparently were looking at that. They expected that of him. So it, his being in this position, sure, is circumstantial because of an injury. But this is not a surprise result. This is apparently the anticipated result by the USC staff. So. I'm I when I saw their performance with Fresno State and thought to myself, yes, Fresno kept it close. Is that indicative of a bad USC team or is that indicative of a decent Fresno team that kept shit interesting? And, you know, if you look at to the, you look at the result this week, I think I thought I was right. Fresno was interesting. Mm -hmm. But USC still seemed dangerous as shit to me just because their wide receiving core is good and their secondary still remains decent. You know, the rest of their defense is you know, a work in clear progress. It's it, they don't they don't start strong, definitely. So there's a way to take advantage of that. But 
you know, Stanford looks anemic as shit. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, wait, wait for this to kick in. You know, like it's like, it's like the guy that just had a five hour energy and he's waiting for that 20 minute <laughs> shablamo. And that's kind of what happened here. And I, I saw this coming. So I'm not surprised. And I do think it's important that people recognize that this USC team is not going to be a doormat by any stretch by the time you, Notre Dame goes to play them. No, and I think on paper, Notre Dame has a lot more talent, matches up. Uh, a lot better with SC than Stanford does because uh, Stanford, man, oof, I don't know what happened to that defense. It looked uniquely awful, um, more, more so than I expected. It looks slow. Yeah, and, and really I was just, well, how bad is Northwestern's offense? If Stanford was able to hold them in check. I mean, look, Adebo's only one guy. You know, yeah, he exactly. was great in the first quarter, but after that it was like, am I going to do this whole do- this whole job myself? I can't. Yeah, and he definitely could because Slovis, he goes 28 for 33. And if you're doing the math, that's only five balls that hit the ground. Three touchdowns, zero interceptions, 492 yards total uh, for SC's variant on the air raid offense. And that's where I, I want to kind of warn people and, and to not sleep on SC. Like, look, should Notre Dame win that game? Yeah, I think when it comes out, Notre Dame will be the favorite team. I think it'll be a decently heavy favorite. I think it'll be more than a possession, most likely, the way things are going. But SC's playing to their strengths, and it's the one thing they haven't done in a long time. Look, Graham Harrell may be Rena Cliff Kingsbury, but he did things at North Texas that North Texas, the other shoe was dropped on them. They just got their asses run out of by SMU. And, and and with a with a guy that is going to get drafted into the NFL, most likely. Uh, you know, late rounder, but for a CUSA quarterback to have that kind of praise doesn't happen by accident. So it might be because of that guy that's now calling plays for SC now. So, and that's always been the thing about SC. They've had that amazing speed, that skill position talent, and that offensive line, look, you know, they're not exactly anything to write home about, but the thing is, that's what the air raid is designed to get around. It's designed, it is all about quick reads. You know, right. if that ball isn't out in a couple of seconds, you've waited way too damn long. You got two to three people that you're looking at, and if you don't know, you then you're taking off. And yep. and it's also it made the running game an actual threat again, because now you're worried about all these quick routes and and getting burned up top, and you're legitimately spread out, having to cover the entire field, knowing that you have so many different weapons that you have to worry about an SC, and now all of a sudden. Yeah, the majority of the touchdowns they scored were on the ground, it, it felt like. Especially yeah. the beginning of the game because they were spread four four wide and then all of a sudden it's like the Red Sea parts and just strolling into the end zone every single time. U- USC has the potential to have a dangerous offense. They did show one particular weakness that I felt was glaring, especially in the first quarter when they were down. It's that they seem to lack kind of discipline, uh, like – Oh, there yeah. doesn't seem to be any sign of a single leader or like a rallying force on that team, neither on offense nor on defense. Does anybody seem to be stepping up and like corralling the troops or, you know, you know, calling out plays or quarterbacking really outside of the actual quarterback position? It just seemed like at any moment, four or five guys were walking up to the line to get set in position and were like still dancing until like a second before the ball is snapped. And like, nobody was looking at anybody. Nobody was communicating any changes. No, everyone, every man for himself. If somebody wanted to throw a punch, guess what? They just did. This is like, there's one thing about it. I mean, the penalty showed, right? They were penalized for almost a hundred yards. Yep. In this game, but you know, they can, they can afford to counterbalance when they're playing a, a completely anemic defense with the speed that they have. But I just feel like that's going to come to bite them eventually, probably sooner rather than later. Absolutely. And that is, and, and that's one of the knocks against Helton that he really isn't, you know, very good at the whole coaching thing. Look, I mean, yeah. he, he's got enough. He, he wised up to know he needed to change something. And it was interesting to get some insight uh, from the booth. But uh, again, he got an Adam Amin booth. So I'm not surprised that they actually got this kind right. of insight because he asked him, when did you know you had to go change the offense? When did you know you had to go start air raiding? He said, after we played Notre Dame last year, because we did elements of it, and then it was very clear, huh, this works. Fuck what we were doing before. Let's do more of this. Let's go find the minds that know how to do this the best, because what I thought I needed to do wasn't working. 
And if Clay Helton has found some moments of clarity where he realized how bad he was fucking things up, that's kind of scary because guess who did that as well? He's in our own backyard. He realized the way he was doing things was leading Notre Dame down a road that was going to end in a freaking fire. So he changed literally everything. And now all of a sudden you get a playoff appearance and you've got at least a team that appears to, to be top 10 quality. Uh, yeah. Obviously there's so many more tests to go, but there was a big turnaround and that's what SC is yeah. trying to do as well right now. And I tell you what, um, I never want to see somebody get injured and then have the happy accident that somebody gets elevated. Uh, but it kind of looks like that's what happened here with yeah, Slovis. It's, it's going to be a problem. All right. Let's go. Uh, Shane mentioned Maryland playing Michigan. Here's why. Maryland 63, Syracuse 20. Again, hope you enjoyed your stay in the top 25, Syracuse, because I, and maybe I should have known something was weird when they didn't, Syracuse didn't light the scoreboard up on Liberty. Uh-huh. And maybe I should have smelled something a little bit sour, but, I mean, Maryland on the other side, they played Howard. They got no business playing Howard. Listen, <laughs> I understand, but I we have to you have to call attention to the fair. And the fact of the matter is, at the beginning of the season, when they, everyone has that cake, that cupcake week to open the season, you know, you see across the country mediocre teams working lesser opponents, right? But you see them working them to the tune of like forty-four to six, or like fifty to ten. Like, oh, look at that! They beat the shit out of FCS, whatever the fuck. But when you see a team putting up seventy-nine, that's like. Alabama death machine numbers like nobody puts up 79 casually they put it up with purpose with a schedule with (laughs) intent you know what I mean like they do it to be mean because they can so like when I saw that 79 pointer I was like yo Maryland's good but no one I don't think anyone's convinced because it's Maryland I wouldn't. I, I will fully admit, I took no stock in that game. None. No, I was like, I immediately was like, I, they were in one of my uh, in one of my parlays in week one that actually paid off. I was like, I just, I, I, I buy it. I buy it. They look really good. And then here we go. Like, they smoke the fucking ass off of Syracuse. You know, all that whole Dino Babers incredible offense shit has now been superseded by holy fuck, Mike Loxley. Hi, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, it's and it completely ruined the the main event of of a very pedestrian week three, uh, you know. And of course, weird shit will always happen. But as far as like getting a marquee game, they were already stretching. And it's like, okay, yeah. you look at the schedule. All right, Clemson and Syracuse. Let's see who Syracuse got. Liberty. Uh, okay, Maryland. All right, we're gonna have a top twenty five matchup here, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll do that. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's roll there. Now game day is going to Ames. They're going to yeah. El Asico. <laughs> yeah. I cannot wait. That game is going to suck. <laughs> it is going to be awful. I can't wait. <laughs> So anyway, uh, let, let's go ahead and throw out just what kind of a beating Maryland threw down here. They have 650 total yards in this game. Yo, Josh, Josh Jackson. Josh Jackson, 21 for 38, 296 yards, three TDs, one interception. Maryland rushes for 354 yards as a team and six TDs, with Javon Leak leading the way with over 100 yards on seven carries and yeah. a 15 average. Jake Funk right behind, five carries, 94 yards. And and the actual people that got the workload were Anthony McFarland Jr. and Tayon Fleet Davis, who combined for four one hundred and forty two yards and three touchdowns on twenty five carries. The best names. On oh, there's it. oh, it's an all name team. Team man. has the best names. I mean, first and foremost, feel the funk. <laughs> look, like if you just take the first four names. No, you know what? Let's just take all five. <laughs> all five names that you just rattled off would make. An amazing boy band structure. Like you got, you got the hot dude Josh Jackson. Then you got Javon Leak. Then you got Jake Funk, the sublime adjacent guy. Anthony McFarland Jr., the prim and proper kid. And then the wild card, Tyon Fleet Davis. Like the whole thing works perfectly. But then you have to add the fact that these are football players. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> Ah, I love it so much. It's so great. And, and like Tommy DeVito tried to carry cues as much as he could. He goes 28 for 39, 330 yards, three TDs, and an interception. That was the offense. That's all they could put up and all they That's could muster. It. And, look, we know Syracuse doesn't have much of a defense ever. 
Um, but man, not to this level. Maryland, all of a sudden, it's you know we all like to to make fun of the Maryland and Rutgers, you know, lopped on, uh, added to the Big Ten uh, type stuff. Um, oops. Yeah. <laughs> I was just sitting there thinking, like, man, the ACC looks strong this year. Oh wait. Ugh. <laughs> Yeah, because that was the only other thing, because Syracuse has given Clemson fits the past couple of years. After yeah. this, uh, I think we might see another murder. Yeah. All right, we're, we'll move along. We're going to quick hit some of these, um, because Nebraska, Jesus Hi. Christ, 34-31, to 31, they lose to Colorado on the road in OT. Shane's doing a dance because uh, man, <laughs> Scott Frost, your homecoming is, is a little rough right now. They blow a 24-14 to 14 lead in the fourth quarter. Not at halftime, in the oh, no. fourth quarter. At the last minute. Yep. <laughs> they led seventeen to nothing at the half. Yes, they did. How? Yes, they did. My mind. Look, I know it's going to take time in Nebraska, no matter how good Scott Frost is. Mm-hmm. But what the fuck? Colorado's so, not that good. <laughs> so in the first half, like you could tell, Colorado wasn't even like conscious. In no. The first like they had <laughs> no idea the game was happening right then. Um. And they were like, oh, shit, we're late. We forgot our pants. We'll be there a quarter late, right? Just like everybody's dad for every party. <laughs> so they showed up in the second quarter, and, you know, they started to slow things down on defense, right? They forced them into a field goal, and they were like, okay, we can finally take some momentum in the second half. But in the second quarter, I started to feel like, man, they have a different gear. Like, they have the ability. Colorado showed the ability that when they're conscious and when they're active, they can go fast. And they can do it very well. Whereas Nebraska didn't seem to have a second gear. They did a lot through Taylor Martinez's legs. And it was working until Colorado adjusted. But neither did they. They they didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's when Colorado started to outpace them. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, I I should throw something down while they're still, like, plus 245. I need to get in on this. (laughs) And that's what I did. I, I need to start asking you for some more advice because apparently I don't know if I have my head for my ass right now. Uh, but, yeah, Steve, Steven Montez, 28 for 41, 375 yards, 2 TD, 1 interception. So, of course, LaVisca Chenault went off, right? No, yeah. not actually. Katie Nixon was your top receiver. Right. Six receptions, 48 yards with a, a TD and a long of 96, which yeah. kicked off the fourth quarter. There's a lot of holy shit moments for Nebraska and Nebraska fans in this one. Uh, extremely rough. Uh, they had a chance to, uh, <laughs> to kick a field goal to tie it up. But um, it's really hard to do that when this is your drive in OT. Rush, no gain. Rush one yard. Sack for a loss of seven. Kick a 48-yarder, miss it. You lose, go home. Ole. <laughs> Ooh, it's craziness. Yeah. All right. I mean, whatever, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matt Brown. Um, uh, did that hire work? <laughs> Two and O right now beats Miami twenty eight to twenty five. Another comeback in this one. Uh, man, Miami. It's like they had an offense, but it's just so weird. They they trailed for the majority of this game. Miami did. Yep. UNC took a ten nothing lead, and they had the lead for all of about three minutes and thirty seven seconds in the fourth quarter, where they then came back scored a touchdown. And then Miami misses a field goal to tie. Oh, geez. Florida teams missing field goals in clutch situations. Never seen that happen before. Wide right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and this was wide right. A 49-yard yeah. field goal to tie. And Mac does it again. 2-0 to start the season. I would Look, not have predicted this for the life of me. No. No. We could not have predicted that UNC would start 2-0. I cannot, however, say that it is because UNC looks awesome. It's yeah. not, that's not what the case is here. They played two questionable teams. Let's be very clear. Will Muschamp is a freaking idiot. Like, we know that. He's a fucking moron. Okay? <laughs> oh, God, like, the full cast rant that Spencer oh, had. Oh, it was beautiful. He is a art. fucking idiot. This is a known thing. I'm not establishing some new narrative. <laughs> I'm not asking him to fight me because other people will join me in this. <laughs> in your state, no less. You will not yeah, have to look state. far. <laughs> and Miami, I mean, let's be honest. Like, this poor kid's offensive line is a, basically a sheet of paper. A, a one-ply sheet of toilet paper stretched out, rolled out from the office. Like, that is his offensive line. The kid is doing everything that he can. Their defense has not quite set yet, even though, you know, Manny Diaz is known for establishing his defensive narrative and and then working from there. They're still working. They're still a work in progress, too. North Carolina just happens to have this 
a freshman quarterback that you have to admit looks a lot better than a freshman. Like he, he's definitely proven that he's a, a better than average freshman. And Mac Brown definitely is taking advantage of that since he's always been strong on, you know, quarterbacks that exceed expectations. He loves his guys that, that be throwing it. Well, he loved that shit. Let me tell you, but, <laughs> but Miami isn't exactly good either. So like, yeah, two and oh, they got here because they ran into two things that have not yet formed into solid pieces yet. Well, you know, we'll see what happens because Wake Forest is decent. You know, now the onus is on them to keep it up. So we'll see what happens now that the pressure is fully on NC having expectations. Yeah, and keep that game on your radar. That's going to be a sneaky hell of a fun time there. Because there's, there's, oh, it's absolute shootout. Uh, too much effort for me to go get the drop right now. Uh, but yeah, it, it will be a shootout. It will be fun. But man, awesome to see that. All right, so we're going to talk a couple teams that I think are going to stay on our radar for morbid curiosity reasons. Tennessee did it again. They lose to BYU. Who, if you remember, fraudulent ass Mormons rant from Eddie got their asses handed to them by Utah. And all of a sudden, here's Tennessee losing to them in double overtime, 29-26. to 26. Tennessee led 13-3 to three up the half. Let them come back. The, get, the score at the end of regulation was 16-16. to 16. Yeah. You have to try to do that. <laughs> I mean, look. I don't think I'm, I'm not, I'm not hot taking here. Like Tennessee is, butt. like they're <laughs> stuck. Like they're going to have the first firing of the season. They, they have to, I'm, they're, they're going to be right. It's I, I, they're pretty much a lock at this point. It, BYU is not this. Oh, come back gritty. Look at this workhorsey team. That's really, you know, really kicks into gear when the, when the going gets no, like they were, they were just flatlined by Utah. And it wasn't even close. This holy war business, whatever the hell, all the extra motivation they should have had, and they basically shit the bed. And then Georgia Georgia State, who Tennessee lo- lost to last week, had to, like, claw back from the jaws of death against Furman this week. It's like, what the fuck? They're bad, man. They just are bad. They are a butt team. And it's just at this point, there's no hiding it. Even under the giant boulder that could have been a BYU win, <laughs> No, they couldn't even do that. Instead, it fell on them and crushed their faces. And this is how you know things are going completely south right now because this all happened despite Tennessee getting 418 yards of offense. They yeah. won the time of possession battle, 34 to 26 minutes. Like They, they held the football Christ. the entire game. They rushed for 242 yards. They were Where? physically <laughs> dominating them. And here's what they did in the second half. I'm not going to take Dan Rubenstein's bit because... I guarantee you this is a drive chart made for his bit. Here's what they did in the second half. Interception, punt, punt, field goal, turnover on downs, punt, end of regulation. What the, what What are you doing? Fuck. (laughs) Okay. It's the, see the the thing is like what, what it sounds like is even just reading the, the drive chart and not having watched the game, but if you watch the game, it's even more evident. Tennessee just gets to a point in the fourth quarter where they just let shit happen. They just let it happen. They've quit it's again. Happening. They've already, it, it happened at the end of the last season. They quit. They just, yep. let's like, let's fast forward to it. Let's just quit They're right just now. Like, Fuck let's it. Get, let's get it over with. Maybe we'll win or not. Fuck it. Let's see what happens. And they just let it go. Oh, man. I mean, uh, about, uh, what are your options? Now? I fully expect Fulmer is going to be on the sidelines at some point in Tennessee. <laughs> Because we have not hit the bottom yet. It is like the Antonio Brown story of the of, of college oh football. It gets continuously dumber. Yeah. This is going to be a rough, rough, rough season. They, they are about to enter conference play. It is going to be so bad. Yeah. I saw some. I saw somebody tweeted. It was like, the, the path to Atlanta is still, still alive. <laughs> in Tennessee. I'm like, okay. Yeah, good luck. Oh, all right. Well, let's let's turn our eyes to another dumpster fire. This one resulted in a win, yeah. if you want to call it that. But it's another overtime game. We're talking Florida State beating uh, the powerhouse that is Louisiana Monroe, forty-five to forty-four. Why such a weird score in overtime? That's because UL Monroe missed the fucking extra point in OT. <laughs> yeah, man. They w- okay. So first of all. UL Monroe led like half of this game. <laughs> and it was, uh, but it was that was after that was after FSU yeah. led for 24 to seven. It's the yeah. same shit they did to BYU. They 
built yeah. a lead, and there it went. Yeah. Uh, to you, uh, to the Boise, yes. Yes, and they did it but, here again. It's crazy. But, I mean, ULM had an answer for everything they did. I mean, this Florida State defense, like, I mean, I'm sorry. Like, it sounds insane to think about, like, five years ago. Like, this was the defense in the nation. This is this defense is like a rent a cop defense. I mean, it's it's genuinely like they walked across the street, you know, and said, "Hey, like anyone, anyone from intramurals, who, like just come on down. We're heading over to host UL Monroe and see what happens." Because Monroe, the way this thing played out at the end, you know, Florida State scores their touchdown. UL Monroe <laughs> on first down from the twenty-five gets it down to the three <laughs> in one pass. One, no problem. And then on the second play, walk the quarterback walks into the end zone untouched. All they got to do is hit the extra point. Uh, and they fucking miss. Uh, they should have won this game. Right. Yeah, and Jay Train in the chat, how much longer is Taggart last in Tennessee? I, I oh, don't he's know. He's fucking screwed. I mean, I'm telling you he's fucked. They're, they're neck and neck. There's a reason why I say these two are going to be on our radar. This is the dumpster fire derby, man. They're going to be the next Florida, uh, Notre Dame buyout butt of the joke though because they would owe this motherfucker so much fucking money <laughs> i'm talking like 30 million um but yeah he's screwed i think this is going to be a really bad situation for him much sooner than later and oregon fans right now just staying warm and toasty by this fire right now oh, man. oh goodness you cannot ask Oof. for anything better all right well i think we have one more thing to do shane just one just one all right let's go ahead and get to it Yes, it is time for the Night's Watch. It is back. So it's going to be the yes. last game we discuss for this one as number 18 UCF takes out FAU Kiffikins, man. What a, what a rough one-two punch. You get Ohio State, and then you get your local Florida murder train coming here. Uh, yeah. The big story for us, of course, uh, one of the main reasons we're watching him is because of Mr. Brandon Wimbush, who was out of this game with an injury and... I don't. I forget exactly what the specific injury is. I was actually shocked, uh, double checking this, that he was not playing. Um, yeah. His replacement, uh, Dylan Gabriel, didn't do a whole lot. I mean, seven of nineteen, two hundred seven completions. You get two hundred forty-five yards. It's kind of fucking okay. Insane. So let me let me <laughs> let me caution all of what you just said a second here because this is how the game played out, right? So FAU is but right, and they're playing in Boca Raton. Lane Kiffin, like most of the game, had his head at a forty-five degree tilt because of how little fuck he gave. Okay, like he's just—he's <laughs> got evident. He's got the perfect job right now, man. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was evident nobody wanted to really be there except for FAU's running back, who was very. Good. But basically, UCF jumps out to a fourteen nothing lead right in the first quarter. Now, the way they do that is by just happening to hit. Every once in a while, the big pass. The way it played out was it was it was fourteen to three. Then it was twenty eight to six. Okay, by the half, <laughs> twenty eight to six. And Dylan Gabriel's stat line was five completions for two hundred yards. <laughs> okay, that's ridiculous. And it was like five of thirteen. Is his percentage is terrible? But they don't give a fuck. That's the brilliance of the office of Josh Heupel. He does not give a shit. He will get you 200 yards on five completions on 40 fucking attempts, if that's what it takes. But they will be up 35 to 7, and you will not understand what happened. Like, that's what UCF started off doing. 
um, by the time the second half kicked off, I mean, they brought in the backup. And, uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was pretty much an ass whooping. Yeah, 574 yards of total offense in this. Uh, UCF on the ground gets 312 yards. I, it's just an absolute ass kicking. This is this is harder than they got whooped by Ohio State. So yeah. uh, and and at home no less. So yeah. and, and look, Ohio State got back on track. So I don't think Wimbush has lost his gig at all at all. No. Uh, no. Especially because of who they got coming next, and that's Stanford, who. Right is on suspicion of looking a lot like butt. Yep. I am licking my chops for the night's watch. You next guys, week. <laughs> UCF is going to beat that ass. I mean, it's going to be awesome. Uh, no. So yeah, I, the, 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 this game, this, this game was an ass whooping start to finish. I have to make a comment more about the generosity stuff. I s- very cautiously, but also, also quite incorrectly took the under on this game when it was at 68. I said, you know what? Ooh. Maybe UCF will just be a little slow because the humidity down here is the worst. And, you know, I know FAU is not going to really be putting up points. Maybe UCF will have a slow quarter or two. I'm going to bank on the 68 under, and I fucking took it. I, I parlayed it. I took <laughs> I took the under. I took UCF to cover at 13, which is a steal. I was like, <laughs> of course. And uh, I parlayed that with Colorado upsetting Nebraska. So I was going to sit there. I put in some decent dough. This is going to be the payday. And then in the fourth quarter, it was 48 to 14. FAU had had just scored a touchdown after two field goals and went for two. And I thought, yes, go for two and fail and leave me a 60 point total so that the next touchdown doesn't fuck me. Right. Great. But they go for two and they get it. So like anything outside of a field goal, I'm super fucked because there is four minutes and 20 seconds left on the clock. And I swear to God, like like an angel from the sky, a thunderstorm rolls suddenly over Bo- Boca Raton. The game <laughs> is delayed 45 minutes, and they fucking called it. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Your boy got paid. Oh, man. See, so what Shane just described, the direct opposite happened to me repeatedly <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> I'm just like, are you kidding me? How is it this bad? How am I getting fucked this hard? But you know what? That's the way it is. I yeah, just got to chalk it up because next thing you know, I will be on the other side of said yeah, story. I will be very depressed next week, I'm sure. But I don't know if it will ever be. There was a goddamn thunderstorm that rolled yeah, over. That just appeared out of nowhere. Listen, I live 30 <laughs> minutes from Boca. This was, shit was clear skies right over here. So that storm just said, fuck this game. I like this total of 62. Bam. <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. That was great. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a definite good bye week. Uh, I enjoyed yeah. inaugural first ever hot dog bye week. I, I'm ready to get back into some Notre Dame football. I missed you dearly this past Hell weekend. Yeah. Excited to get back on that train and whip the living dog shit. Like I said, so bad, beat New Mexico, that Bob Davey feels it all the way back at home. That's the yep. goal. That is the end goal. Well, uh, Shane, we did it. Let's get back to football. What do you say? I'm down with it. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. And, of course, I can blow out our eardrums every single time on this. <laughs> you can always subscribe to us over at uh, Apple Podcasts, anchor.fm, slash the little sun, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts at. You can also join us in Discord. There's our live chat channel, herlittlesons.com, slash Discord. And, of course, you can always find us at our home over at herlittlesons.com. We'll see you Wednesday for picks. Until next time, y'all, go Irish, beat Lobos. Have a good one.